Thanks everyone for joining us. This is our second installment of Chestnut Chat. We have a really exciting group of folks to share with you today. We've got uh, Kathy Mays from our Virginia chapter. We've got uh, Brian Roth with our main chapter uh, coming to us from Canada. We've got Leela Pinchot who has worked with several different chapters and is now in Ohio with the US Forest Service. And then our uh, final panelist will be Charlie Tarver a few ha uh, housekeeping things. If you have a question, please use the q and I'll be monitoring that as time goes around. Um, I'll either answer questions directly in that Q&A or we'll answer it live. Uh, if you have any issues, use the uh, chat function. And uh, to get things started, I think what we'll do, um, I'm gonna mute myself. Leela, if you mute your video, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to give a little bit more overview of the program and to turn it over to, to Kathy. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we had such a great turnout for our Chestnut Chat last week. We decided to try these every Friday just so we can connect as a community. Um, one of the great things about the mission of the American Chestnut Foundation is the people. So we thought this week, um, as a follow-up to uh, Sarah Fitzsimmons and Jared Westbrook, our science leadership team, and myself sharing our chestnut stories and why we're involved, we could bring in uh, four uh, panelists and volunteers in honor of Volunteer Appreciation Week and Earth Day to share their stories because we would be such a diminished organization without our, our volunteers. They are our heart and soul. Um, they, have, they manage over 500 orchards from Maine to Alabama. Um, completely volunteer run with the help of the regional science coordinators. So um, the volunteers are really, really important to keeping our mission moving forward. So we have four of these intrepid volunteers to tell their stories this morning in about five minutes or so um, each. And then we'll open it up for um, any kind of discussion that anybody wants to have. And uh, I just want to add my thanks to Sarah's for all of you to join us. And uh, I hope you had a good Earth Week and um, with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy Mays, my friend and colleague. Kathy is uh, a former uh, board member and she was a uh, Virginia chapter president. She managed a lot of orchards. She is a tried and true chestnutter and uh, we're very grateful to have her this morning. So Kathy, take it away. Is that all right, Sarah? I didn't know if you wanted to introduce Kathy. No, that's great. Okay. All right, I'm on. You're on. Um, good morning, everybody. And I don't know what it takes to be a true chestnutter, but I guess I wrote the job description. Um, I was, um, like many of the volunteers we have, a recent retiree when I got connected with the Chestnut Foundation. It seems to be a time in our lives when we're ready for a change and we're ready for getting involved in something that's completely unlike what we've been doing before. So um, I was an attorney and I was doing international consulting and I spent a lot of my life indoors. And I knew when I retired that I wanted to spend my life outdoors. Um, so I kind of looked around at different activities in my community and it's a small rural community that I live in. So there's not a whole lot in the way of organizations. Um, but I found there was a native plant society and. Um, they were doing a lot to uh, promote native plants and, and clean up native plant habitat. Um, so I was having a good time with that group and lo and behold, the Chestnut Foundation decided to open a Virginia chapter. So I offered to write a little story for the native plant newsletter about the American chestnut. Um, and that I would say was the beginning of the bug. Um, so I wrote a little story and I sent it over in draft to the man who organized the, the uh, chapter, and he didn't comment. So I ca called his office and said, I don't want to publish this if I have things in here that aren't true, um, and I wasn't really sure what the mission of the chapter was. So again, he ignored me. So I showed up in his office one day and I said, you know, this is no way to run an organization. <laughs> so he said, well, I did find one mistake and that we don't call Virginia uh, BPI anymore. We call it Virginia Tech. So after waiting a month to find out that, um, I published the article and I said um, I would be glad to help you get this chapter going. So that was the beginning. And 
um, everything needed to be do done. Office work needed to be done, um, negotiations with landowners to find property to plant on, recruiting volunteers, buying equipment. It was just, it was just a lot of fun. Um, and so a lot of my friends ask me, when you retire, how do you get involved in something like you got involved in Chestnut? And I've thought about that a lot because I didn't come out interested just in chestnuts, of course. I, I knew the chestnut story, but it was way in the background of my brain. Um, but what I found was that the whole idea of helping the environment was really important to me. And when I looked around at what was happening around here, the chestnut was the one thing that was in my backyard that I could really help. Um, I don't live at the beach. I don't live in, this, you know, in the West Coast. Um, I live in Appalachia, and that's one of the most important things I think in any um, list of important things is um, forest diversity, forest health. Um, so that's what we did. We started working on finding landowners. And the other thing I discovered was that how involved you get and how well you recruit other volunteers is whether you like the people you're working with. And it's so personal. And we, I just made some great friends. Um, people who love to dig in the dirt um, are my kind of people. So um, we were pretty successful finding landowners that wanted to plant chestnuts and take care of them. Um, it's a tree that tells its own story. Um, so I got involved, as I said, first just doing everything. And then as time grew and we grew, um, we had we picked up really some expertise in the science area. We picked up some expertise on um, basically farming type of issues, like how to build a fence that doesn't blow over when a 50-mile-an-hour gust. That was this week's experiment. Um, so it's just... Um, a little bit of everything, but mainly it's the people, and that ma makes it worth it for me. Okay. Any comments, questions? Thank Thanks, Kathy. Sure. Um, I let me show my video. I really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this. I, I remember one of my favorite memories is one of the early retreats that we had with the American Chestnut Foundation, and you and Kathy Marmet and Essie Burnworth, we were all in a, it was like a camp and it, we'd like gone away to camp staying in this, in this retreat in Virginia. Um, so I really appreciate your, your long term work with the foundation and all the amazing things you've done. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, the other thing I should share, that place where we had our retreat was a 4-H center and they had plastic covers on the mattresses so you didn't wet the bed. There you go. <laughs> it was one of the most uncomfortable places I've ever stayed in my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Kathy. So if, if any um, questions come up uh, toward the end, um, I'll be sure to pass them on. I've, I've caught up with the Q&As and I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. So I think what we'll do is uh, next on deck, we have Brian Roth. Uh, Brian just got back from Nepal. Um, he worked uh, for a long time at the University of Maine and uh, is now in Canada. Uh, so, but he, he led the Maine Chapters Breeding pro Program for many years, and we're really lucky to have him on and, and share some share a chestnut short story with us. So, Brian, would you take it away? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I really enjoy um, these meetings that we have, this kind of informal drop-in. Can everyone hear and see me okay? I can, I can see you good. Well, oh, perfect. well, that's correct. Thank you. Um, yes, I am in Canada, but I'm a member of the main chapter. I've been a member since 2012 when Bucky Owen uh, approached me and said, I really should get involved with this. I've been following the restoration program as a scientist for a number of years and was absolutely thrilled about taking um, uh, a hands-on approach and, and getting in with the other volunteers. This really is a volunteer project. The citizen science program is incredible. Um, I'm a dual citizen. That's why I ended up back here in Canada. Uh, I was in Nepal uh, taking a break from the University of Maine where I'm on the graduate faculty. Uh, so I was taking a break and working with a nonprofit that's doing um, establishing uh, tree nurseries in remote villages uh, and regions with women's groups. 
to promote food security, income generation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I evacuated um, pretty quick. Uh, I left in December to go over there. So now I'm here in Canada for a while. I'm looking forward to getting back to the East Coast and Maine and doing some work over there. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the, the reasons why I'm involved um, and then lead into a little project that I worked on that uh, had a very nice result. And that was finding the tallest chestnut tree in the native range of uh, North America. So to start with, um, the, the nice thing about working with the American Chestnut Foundation, particularly as a forester that I'm trained with and as a scientist, is I get to use all the tools I was uh, trained to use. So everything from genetics and pathology, nursery establishment, I get to do some vegetation management, fertilizer, and working in greenhouses. It absolutely hits uh, on every aspect of my training as a forester, including public speaking. Um, and so these things all come together and it's an absolutely beautiful thing to work with as a volunteer. So I really appreciate that opportunity. And we couldn't do this project without the citizen scientists and volunteers, people from all walks of life coming together to bring together uh, all of our uh, talents and, and treasures and everything to make this thing work. And we're on the way. Uh, we really appreciate the uh, efforts of uh, the leadership and, and team uh, under Lisa's direction. So I'm very excited to be part of this group. And we reach a lot of people. Some of the people I work with are students um, with bright ideas and lots of tools at the university. I like working with school groups, um, foresters, conservation groups. And uh, we're usually able to find um, a project that we can tie all of that together with. That's when we really know we're onto something good, um, particularly for me and my effort. And the one thing that is unique to Maine and that's nice is we have quite a few large surviving American trees on this north end of the distribution. And there are some beautiful specimens. The nice thing is they produce flowers in July. Um, a lot of them uh, that are a little bit stressed and we can see those uh, because they stand out from the canopy when you're looking from a distance. So with this uh, new effort to discover wild American trees and capture their germplasm and get that into the, uh, the, our program for capturing that genetic diversity, uh, I was always thrilled about looking for big trees and finding them. Uh, that is a needle in a haystack. And one of the thoughts was, if we could see these flowers from the air, maybe we'd be able to pick them out of a crowd. Um, but we needed to narrow the search down. Maine is a huge state, 19 million acres plus that is forested. And only a small part of that is actually suitable for American chestnut habitat. Uh, and of that, a lot of it uh, is kind of broken up. And so you're looking for things uh, we really wanted to narrow that search down in talking to people. So I got this idea that other people had been working on chestnut suitability habitat maps. So that's taking geographic information system and inputting things like the soils maps and the temperature maps, um, uh, precipitation, all of these things that we know the chestnut is suitable for from literature and from the trees that are already growing and build this map that would then kind of pin, narrow down our search uh, area, if you will. So I worked with um, the literature that others had done and some of their maps. Uh, I know a lot of people have been involved with that. Uh, and then we made our own map in suitability map in Maine uh, with student help at the University of Maine. Uh, then we took that map and went flying in an airplane in the right months and we're able to pinpoint a whole bunch of areas to go and follow up on later in the season. So we did that. We had a group of volunteer students and we hit the road and one of the trees we found was this very tall tree over 100 feet tall that um, was not very big around because it was fighting the light and growing up through uh, the canopy but it was an American chestnut and it was officially uh, documented as the tallest in North America. And so that's my little story and happy to answer questions and uh, be around as long as people would like to be. 
Thanks, Brian. That's awesome. That, that's definitely one of the most uh, amazing finds, uh, especially the way that you guys were able to find that tree. That's, that's such a good story. Um, so I, I don't have any questions right now, but if, if folks do, please uh, put it in the chat there um, or put it, oh, here we have a question. Uh, do you have any idea how old that tree is? Well, we didn't actually um, core that tree to try to get an age on it, but we could estimate the age based on the age of the trees around it and especially the, the use of the land beforehand. So it was a pasture, uh, a grazing pasture all the way up until the early 1900s. So I would expect it's somewhere uh, around 90 to 100 years old. Wow, very cool. Um, another question, is it possible to get a copy of that suitability map for Maine? It is. I can put a link um, in the chat room to an online web-based um, kind of a little mini GIS layer, and you can go through and turn on different layers in it. And one of them is chestnut suitability, and we have that classified into three different classes. So we have a very high probability, medium, and, and lower. So I will put that link in there as soon as um, I'm done with my video. Cool. Uh, all right, we're going to get a couple more questions. Uh, Derek asks, have you used or do you know of anyone using machine learning techniques to scour aerial photography for chestnuts or other trees in an automatic fashion? It's something that's been thought of. Uh, it really depends on the quality of the image. If you're looking at a chestnut tree, it's not all going to be covered in flowers all the time. So there's um, a range of, of sensitivity that you would need to pick up of that specific color. So you're really going to be able to see large trees that are dominated by flowers. And of that, when you think of the canopy width of those trees, it may only be you know, 20 to 50 feet in diameter. And a lot of the resolution of those images isn't big enough to pick that up. So you're gonna to need to have very high resolution images. And I don't think that we have anything from the satellites at this point that would work. Um, but if you were to take a lot of pictures from an airplane, uh, that might be possible. Cool. And <clears throat> one more question. Uh, the tree that you found, does it exhibit any resistance to blight? Well, at the moment, uh, we didn't see any blight in it. There is blight in the trees in the neighborhood. Um, I, I, I don't think it's resistant. Of course, you know, you know that uh, these native trees really don't have inherent resistance, but I don't think, I think it was kind of sheltered growing up in between all those trees and the branches pruned off very quickly and the wound sealed up and it's not getting beat up by other things. So it's possible that it just, um, it's just the environment that it's in, but it does not have blight at this point. A question on my own, uh, does, does it produce nuts? Have you guys been able to, to get them or do you plan on grafting it? It um, produces burrs, but not nuts. There is other trees in the area, so we're not sure why it's not pollinating. Maybe it's high in the canopy or just older. Uh, I believe last year or the year before, uh, a local forester sent a climber up with some pollen. So we can follow up and see what happened there. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Brian. We really appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I look forward to these uh, chats every week. Great. Um, all right. Well, uh, next on deck, we have Leela Pinchot. Uh, Leela, uh, I've worked with Leela in Chestnut since I think 2004. Um, we put some trees up on the Milford Experimental Forest in Northeastern PA, and then she worked with the Chestnut Foundation for a couple of years, and then went to get her doctorate at the University of Tennessee, and now works with the U.S. Forest Service in Ohio. So, hi, Leela, and thanks for joining us. Hi. Yeah, this is fun. Thanks for, for having me. This is great. Um, yeah, so as Sarah said, I'm, I'm now working for the Forest Service. I'm... Um, where some of my research is focused on American chestnut, how to reintroduce it into forested ecosystems. I also um, am working with American elm um, to restore that species. Um, and I'm currently an Ohio chapter member, though I've, I've been a Connecticut chapter member, I've been a, a, a Tennessee chapter member, and I may have been a Pennsylvania chapter member. I can't remember for sure because I've moved around a lot over the past 15 years. Um, I first 
became interested in American chestnut when my father took me out to a large tree about 10 inches in diameter that was on our property in eastern Pennsylvania. This was a, a beautiful tree that was part of the overstory canopy, um, kind of like the tree that Brian was talking about, though not nearly as large. Um, and you know, my father took the time to tell me about the story and tell me about this wonderful community of people that were working together to try to restore the species. And there's something so compelling to me you know, as a 16-year-old thinking about this problem that we created that now we are working together to try to fix. It just stuck with me. Um, and so in college, I volunteered for Sandy Anagnostakis at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, I was living near New Haven, where I grew up, and that's where she happened to be. And that turned into two summer jobs, which was a lot of fun working with Sandy, who's just um, an incredible scientist and really quite a formidable presence. Um, I have lots of memories of squeezing into a small Ford Ranger with Sandy and her technician, Pam, and um, bumping along Connecticut looking for chestnuts, uh, measuring chestnuts, and always stopping for ice cream on the way home. Lots of good memories. Um, then let's see. I remember the first time that I became involved with the American Chestnut Foundation, my dad suggested that I reach out uh, to Marshall Case, who was the president at the time, and call him. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely an introvert, and as the you know, a high school student was extremely shy, and the thought of cold calling the president of this really cool organization was terrifying to me. And I remember shaking when I was on the phone with him. And of course, he's you know, super chill, super nice guy, and was excited about how um, the military experimental force could get involved. Um, and that started, you know, uh, like Sarah said, in around 2004. And we've been working with them ever since. Um, so again, like Sarah said, I worked for the American Justin Foundation for you guys. She was my boss, which was, of course, a lot of fun. One of the memories that, that I immediately think of when thinking of working for Sarah, uh, when I was, uh, went down to Meadowview, one of the times I went down there to meet with Fred and um, learn more about the breeding process, et cetera, Sarah recommended that I might take a motorcycle ride with one of the farmhands, um, who I will not name. Um, was a big, burly motorcycle dude, and I said, all right. So he, he offered to take me around, and um, again, I was very shy, uh, and what I thought was going to be just a quick motorcycle ride around the block turned into a two-hour motorcycle jump through the mountains of you know, uh, southwest Virginia, uh, which actually was a lot of fun. So Sarah, thank you for that, even though at the time <laughs> it was um, not exactly what I was expecting, but good, good memories. Um, lots of opportunities for personal growth working for the foundation. Let's see. Um, you know what? When I think about chestnut, obviously it's part of my career, which I'm really thankful for. But ultimately, what's most meaningful about this work is how it uh, brings me closer to my father. He got me involved in this from the beginning. Over the past 15 years, we've worked together on a handful of different plantings on our property. Um, and every summer I drive home, he meets me there and we trek up to one of the plantings. We battle the rubus that's grown up and all the other vegetation that's grown up around the chestnuts and we measure the trees. We look for survival, we look for signs of light, we uh, look for growth and record all that data. Um, and by the time we get out, we're we're scratched up from all the blackberries, we have twigs in our hairs, we're hot, we're parched, we're tired, irritable, but you know, we have this, this common passion together um, and it brings us together and I'm really thankful for that. So um, this is great work. It's e even for someone who's an introvert and prefers to be in the woods than with other people, ultimately it really is about the people and I appreciate that, so thank you. Thanks, Leela. Uh, and thanks for taking the time to share that story. Um, I too have taken a few motorcycle rides <laughs> around southwestern Virginia, and it's, it's, it's really cool to see um, the influence of chestnut in, in that area. Uh, there's a ton of chestnut sprouts around. Um, as I shared last week, I grew up in southern West Virginia, and it really reminds me of it's pretty much the same ecosystem. 
um, and, and forest area. But uh, we do have a question that I think you'll be able to address, Lila, if you don't mind. This is from, from Frank Scalick in Ohio, who, whom I think you know. He says, I've seen pictures of trees loaded with burrs and assume they have viable seeds. We have had several seedlings develop naturally from seeds. How much natural regeneration is happening from seeds these days? I keep hearing stories that, is, that it is rare. Why? Oh, um, Sarah, you may actually be better posed to answer that question since your research really delves into that. Um. I, I can. So, I mean, we, uh, so the first time I've seen natural regeneration in a couple of places. Uh, the primary, uh, West Salem stand in Wisconsin is the primary example. That was a stand that many of you have uh, heard or read about. It was focused uh, uh, on in a National Geographic article back in 1989. And that was a site that had a, a farmer from Pennsylvania took nine seed, planted them, and that turned into like 30 acres of American chestnut. So the whole question is why, how do you get that to happen? Um, if you look at native stands of the American chestnut in that natural range, uh, there's a site in northern uh, Vermont in Berlin, there's a site in northern Maine in Atkinson, there's a site in northern Indiana uh, in, in Roselawn that I've worked on. All of these sites have natural regeneration, but they are on the either outside of or on the extreme northern edge of the range. Um, I have rarely seen natural regeneration within the natural range until two years ago. No, it was last, last fall at the Itty 1833 meeting. Um, Amy Matheny and Matt Casson from WVU took our group out to uh, Savage River State Forest in Western Maryland uh, to a site that they're working on deploying hypovirulence and there was natural regeneration um, happening I wouldn't say all over the place, but you could definitely find seedlings, seeds still attached. Um, so it happens in some places, it doesn't in others. I rarely see it in Pennsylvania, even in locations where thousands of chestnuts are, are happening. I, I imagine it's some combination of predator and herbivory pressure and how many seeds were created in a given year. Most sites where there is um, chestnut production, I'd say there's too much predation pressure to allow them to grow into seedlings. But, you know, at, at this time, it's a lot of hand waving. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. And I, I might ask Brian. Brian, if you're still on here, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, I am on here. And um, it does seem that it's predation, but also habitat. So uh, you need to have some sunlight and some space to get those things up and going. And the problem is that's good habitat for the weeds and the browsing animals and deer. So everything is stacked against natural regeneration. And that's why you see those stump sprouts really um, taking over when you do see chestnut. Thanks, Brian. Um, and so Tom Saeli, who was with us on that tour, said that he's got, um, he, I'm not going to say that he transplanted one, but um, he, he wrote in here that he's got one that survived um, in a location that has yet to be named. So Mark Double wrote Leela, but didn't finish the, the thought. So, um, okay, there's a, another comment here too. There's an article in the 2019 fall issue of the Chestnut Magazine about the Rose Lawn Tree in Indiana by Bruce Wakeland. So if you want to read up a little bit more on that, I recommend it. Um, okay. Uh, and then to follow up to uh, that, uh, Brian did post in the chat a link to get to that chestnut suitability habitat map. So you guys can check that out. Um, and I'm sure we'll take more. Oh, here we go. Uh, Mark Double asks, Leela, what experiments are you conducting in Ohio with American chestnut? So I'm actually not working um, in Ohio with chestnut. Um, all my work is in Western Pennsylvania, just over the border um, in and around the Allegheny National Forest. Um, because um, I work for the Forest Service and there's an interest um, by the Allegheny National Forest. They have a real chestnut advocate there. I mean, and I have a few studies. One um, that the, the Chestnut Foundation helped fund is looking at different silvicultural treatments. And there will be an article coming out in the next issue of Chestnut Magazine that um, describes some early results from that. 
Um, a longer uh, a study that we put in in 2015, we're looking at how uh, site quality, site productivity impacts chestnut growth, um, its ability to compete with other species, and then in the longer term, um, how site productivity impacts blight um, severity. Um, and I, I can't speak much to blight severity at this point because only 10% of the trees have become infected. So that really will require you know, probably 15 years to, to assess. And, and Mark, I should probably talk to your team about uh, methods for doing that uh, well. Um, and then we have another study um, in the same area looking at uh, deer impact on chestnuts and across a, a gradient of uh, deer densities, looking at um, you know, browse incidents on, on planted chestnut. Thanks, Leela. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple more questions. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Isabel. I'm typing out a long response to your question. So <laughs> she asks about um, transplant. She got a bunch of bare roots, American chestnut bare roots, and uh, she wants to plant it in Maine, but she's uh, stuck in Brooklyn due to the uh, do not travel shelter in place restrictions. So looking for um, advice on how to handle the seedlings. Leela, I know you've planted quite a few bare roots. I don't know if you have any recommendations on how you might keep them alive? Uh, well, what, so we're actually in a similar predicament um, and we will be just potting them up. So if, if it's possible, if you have pots and potting soil, because um, they need to, they're probably waking up if they, uh, they will be soon if they aren't already. So they need to be potted up. At least that's, that's what I would do. Um, so, so that's that's what I'm recommending. I'm recommending containerizing, especially if you're going to try and plant it this year. We like uh, tall ones, the stewy tall ones. They're one gallon or even five gallon pots are really good. Um, if you use those, get some milk crates to help uh, keep them from falling over. There are also black plastic bags, really thick, um, was it five mil or eight mil plastic that you can get that that's a ton cheaper um, and, and plant them in that, but definitely get a tall bag that's like one to five gallons in size. Um, email me for more specific um, recommendations, but I'm also sending a typed up answer to that. Um, let's see, what's the latest on root rot resistance? I'll answer that after Charlie. Uh, has there been a site suitability map for Pennsylvania? Yes, uh, there've been two. Um, I can share that with you. Um, shoot me an email. I'm Sarah, S-A-R-A, at A-C-F dot O-R-G. Um, how feasible, okay, this is a good question. How feasible might it be to encourage seed production from large surviving Americans by clearing away competing trees? You want to address that, Leela? Um, I mean, again, Sarah, I think you probably have a lot more experience with this. Not to punt, but this is kind of in your wheelhouse. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it's absolutely uh, feasible to encourage seed production by clearing away competing trees. We find that when you uh, release, so that process would be called release, when you release a tree, it grows up to, when you release an American chestnut, it can grow up to an inch or more in diameter a year. Usually they start producing seeds um, two to three years after release. And the downside to doing that is that you leave it open to more blight infection. So just be aware that once it grows faster, um, it will probably perish faster. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, do I recommend it? I, I mean, it's going to die of the blight anyway eventually, and if you can get it to produce seeds, I feel like that's a really good use of that, you know, trees, that sprouts lifespan. Um, let's see, in Western Pennsylvania, did they ever plant American chestnuts at the Erie National Wildlife Refuge as they were planning to do? Yes, we planted on the Erie National Wildlife Refuge in the spring of 2018. And Jules, I don't know, but I, is, isn't there a video of me doing planting of those bare roots on the back of a tree planter? If there is, then we'll make that available if you guys want to check out that video <laughs> is actually a lot of fun to use a tree planter. Um, do you ever use grow bags to grow seedlings? Uh, yes, I think that's I think that's what I'm speaking of. We call them grow bags, those black plastic bags, and and I like them personally. There's issues with any kind of pot that you use, but that's beyond the purview of this this given webinar. Um, okay, 
All right, I think that's about it. Leela, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and sharing your story. And it's been just amazing to uh, work with you over the past few years. And I'll look forward to our continued relationship. Um, Likewise, thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks. okay. Uh, all right, so on deck next is Charlie Tarver. Uh, Charlie, are you, there you are, all right. I am. Uh, Charlie, you work for the Longleaf Alliance, is that? Oh no, I don't work for anyone. I'm just okay. an old retired guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I well, work for Susan. I, um, I, will, I will let you share uh, your, your chestnut short story. I really, I think you're joining us from Highlands, North Carolina. Is That's that, correct. Okay, all right, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you coming and uh, sharing your story and uh, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Tarver. Uh, I'm a retired forester. And American chestnut is the second tree that I've fallen in love with in my life. Uh, my wife and I spend the warm months of the year in Western North Carolina, and we spend the cold months in Southwestern Georgia. And uh, Lisa, thank you for inviting me to tell my story about falling in love with America's most iconic tree. And since I suspect all of you know much, much more than I do about American chestnut, I will strictly limit my comments to telling you how I fell in love with this tree and uh, became a supporter of the Chestnut Foundation and uh, the efforts to restore American chestnut. So with that, I'm gonna take off this long leaf hat and I'm gonna put on my American chestnut hat. And uh, from now on, you can all just call me Charlie Chestnut if you want to. Lisa came up with that uh, a year or so ago when we had a little event here in Highlands and we had an awful lot of fun uh, with uh, some little American chestnuts. Uh, my first exposure to anything even close to American chestnut was during my early childhood growing up on a farm in LA. Now, where I come from, LA stands for Lower Alabama. Uh, there were no American chestnut trees in Lower Alabama, and to the best of my knowledge, there never had been any, since uh, Lower Alabama is well below the southern end of the natural range of American chestnut. But we did have some remaining chinkapins, uh, a first cousin, of course, of American chestnut, Castania pumilla. And Lisa, you'll notice that I still say Castania. And I'm sorry if you and everybody else mispronounces the genus. Uh, Castania just sounds so much better to me. And so we call our place up here uh, Castania. So if that's incorrect, I know you'll forgive me. Uh, my brothers and sisters and I growing up on the farm in lower Alabama uh, enjoyed collecting the chinkapin nuts uh, those few that had not already been taken by the squirrels uh, and the blue jays. Uh, but that was my first uh, exposure. Of course, I didn't know anything about American chestnut or the genus or the science of any of it. I just knew I liked chinkapins. Now, fast forward, if you will, for about 35 years. And uh, I'm a forester active in business and I find myself on the board of the American Forestry Association in Washington, DC, where I have the great pleasure and privilege of coming into contact with some incredibly smart, interesting people from around the country who are connected to conservation and forestry. One of those really smart, interesting people was a fellow that many of you know named Don Willicke. Now, Don was heavily involved with the origination, I guess, the early years of the foundation, and he would literally talk your ear off about American Chestnut and about the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, but frankly, I was so busy uh, with my business and I was involved with Longleaf, most of what Don said kind of went in one ear and out the other. Uh, I was already active in the Longleaf Alliance, uh, and Don would probably say that most of what he said never made it into my first ear. Uh, he gave me a hard time. But anyhow, uh, he, 
he planted something inside there that uh, that didn't come out for for some years. I was at the time really involved with the Longleaf Alliance. Uh, like American Chestnut, Longleaf had been virtually wiped out. Um, but for a very different reason, Longleaf didn't suffer from a blight. We simply cut them all down and they were replaced by Loblolly and Slash Pine. And we cut out all the fires that had uh, promoted uh, Longleaf stands and given them an edge over their competition. But anyhow, some of what Willicky said must have stuck with me. Uh, and about 20 odd years ago, um, my wife and I uh, bought a place in Southwest Georgia that had a lot of old growth longleaf pine on it. And we developed it into uh, our place, uh, primarily a quail hunting plantation. Uh, but my thing was, uh, was the longleaf pine. So when Susan decided to build a house there, uh, part of what she wanted to put in the in my what was called my part of the house was a custom made gun cleaning table, and she gave me the opportunity to select the wood to have that table made. And something that Willie planted in there popped back in, and I said, you know, chestnut would probably be pretty good. So uh, we built that table out of chestnut and it's absolutely stunning and that sort of started my uh my feelings for american chestnut uh, and we named our place down there longleaf we've uh, we've had several places we named them all after trees but uh, we've had a uh, many many good years at at longleaf and i uh, have actually planted more chinkapin uh, trees there and and uh have fun sharing those trees with people. That's the only thing close to chestnut that will grow in that part of the wood. Um, so fast forward a few more years and Susan and I decide we, we wanna live on the coast on the water over in South Carolina. So we buy a place down in the low country in the very Southern part of South Carolina that well below Charleston. And doing a little research on the area where we're building on the May River, I learned that in the old days, uh, the old timers called that area Chinkapin Ridge. And obviously there must have been chinkapins there at one time. So a year or two later, tromping around in the woods near where we were building, I found a chinkapin tree that was uh, alive and doing well at the time and uh, produced uh, a good crop of nuts, which I collected and sprouted. and uh, those, That's the source of the chinkapins that I now have growing at Longleaf. Uh, and oh, by the way, we call that the home that we built down there, Chinkapin. Uh, so uh, from there, we move uh, our interest a few years ago to North Carolina. It started getting too hot for us uh, in the summer in Southwest Georgia and, and in Bluffton, uh, South Carolina. So uh, we found a piece of land up here in North Carolina. Uh, right on the edge of Highlands. Uh, and in tromping about on that, uh, on that land, is about 30 acres or so, I found hundreds and hundreds of little chestnuts growing. I mean, real live American chestnuts uh, growing on there. And I, I got so excited about it. So I started reading and studying. And then I started, uh, uh, you know, thinking about, well, could, could we really get some growing here? And fortunately, uh, I was able to meet Lisa through a mutual friend, Kier Klepsig, uh, who is the uh, director of the Jones Ecological Research Center, uh, our next door neighbor to Longleaf uh, down in Southwest Georgia. So uh, Kier got the two of us together and uh, Lisa and I became fast friends and, and uh, I've just begun to learn a bit about American chestnut and just absolutely uh, love it. And I have planted four little chestnuts that uh, I, I don't know how to describe what generation they are, but they're fairly advanced, hopefully, in their ability to resist the blight. And uh, I guess I'll know in 20 or 30 years how well they do. 
but they're doing really, really well right now. And uh, I, I hope to plant some more, uh, if I can find uh, some more good sites uh, on our property. Uh, I'm, I'm still in love with the Longleaf Alliance. I'm still in love with Longleaf. Uh, I know that I can only have one wife, uh, Susan, but I think it's okay for me to be in love with more than one tree. Uh, so I'm going to limit it, I think, to those two, although I like most all of them. Um, I'll close with a few words about the future. Uh, in July, I'll be 75 years old, so I'm not likely to live more than about another 40 years or so. And during that time, I envision seeing healthy, thriving, blight-resistant American chestnut trees throughout its natural range. Uh, and I envision gathering and eating chestnuts from the trees that I've planted at Castania, Lisa. And I'm honored to have been invited to speak to be the new guy on the block amongst this group of highly seasoned chestnut veterans. I really, really uh, appreciate being able to tell my story and I thank you for listening. Great story, Charlie. Thank you so much. Hey, you know, it wasn't actually Kira that brought us together. I don't know if you remember being at Chuck Lavelle's plantation, Charlene. Chuck Lavelle, by the way, everyone is a rock and roller. He was with the Almond Brothers Band, um, and he's now touring with the Rolling Stones as the keyboardist and the musical director. He, he called me my first week on the job and said, hey, can I, can I get some chestnuts? And I went, I was just like agog because I grew up with the Almond Brothers. And I said, oh my God, I'm such a fan of yours. And he said, well, I'm a fan of yours. So long story short, Ch um, Chuck and I um, became buddies and we were scheming to get um, our honorary director, President Carter, over to his plantation, Charlene, to do some quail hunting. And um, a bit of an entourage was there. And Charlie was in the audience when they were all loading up in the, in the hunting buggy. And this guy, Charlie, kept talking about chinkapins and talking about chinkapins. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Chestnuts are pretty cool, too. Let me tell you about chestnuts. So we were doing our fun little bantering. And later on, I asked Chuck who this chinkapin guy was. And he goes, well, he's really a longleaf guy. And I went, well, that's cool. I love longleaf, too, actually. You know, I did some longleaf restoration, wiregrass restoration in my Nature Conservancy days. So I just, I think I just gave you a call. And we just start chatting. And... Um, you know, we've had a couple of adventures together, including you um, hosting Jared Westbrook and I at Longleaf and then uh, your wonderful event two summers ago now, I guess, um, in Highlands. So uh, Charlie's a great new enthusiast. Um, we all love all kinds of trees, so we'll forgive him to have more than one tree love in his life. And you can call it Castanea or Castania anyway. I think it's pronounced both ways. I haven't heard otherwise but um thank you charlie you're um a great great storyteller and a lot of fun and we're so glad to have you on the team thank you so much thank you lisa sarah you want to um do some wrap up before we close we're actually somewhat on time today yeah sure i've got a couple more questions here that folks asked uh let's see the latest update on root rot resistance uh or if I, uh, the what's caused by phytophthora cinnamomi uh, so we continue to investigate uh, the various pedigrees and lines that we have for Phytophthora root resistance. Uh, and it looks like it's very promising that we have uh, some moderate resistance in our materials and are working uh, very closely with uh, uh, SUNY ESF and other partners to try and get that integrated into other blight resistant uh, materials and get it diversified. Uh, there's a lot more upcoming um, there's some great papers that'll be out very shortly. Um, our, our magazine has tons of information about uh, root rot resistance. So it's something that we continue to work on, continue to improve, uh, but we also have some very promising lines that we'll be able to integrate into restoration populations. Um, is the American chestnut planted on the White House lawn still alive? I don't know. Lisa, do you? I've been trying to figure that out. Um, I think not. I think it was planted um, during George W. Bush's it was. Um, uh, time in office. And um, this is a classic example where you need to um, cultivate and 
befriend groundskeepers and landscape experts um, in a large estate like that, like the White House is a large estate. So I understand, I think I heard that they got overwatered and they did um, die, but I'm, I'm hopeful someday we can get them replaced. All right, good. Um, I have a question for Brian. Brian, if you're still around, if you wanna hop on. Uh, Dr. Roth, ever try planting hops to reduce deer interest? Brian, you're muted. How about that? Now, how about go. that? You yeah, can hear yeah, me? Yeah. Uh, I have not um, planted hops to uh, repel deer. Um, deer are, are opportunists, so um, it's possible. Um, but there are too many deer and too much space for us, so that would be difficult. But um, I think the only thing I've found that's successful is a cage or a fence. Um, I, just uh, by coincidence, I think, let's see, oh, May 20th. So there's a group of researchers at Cornell that have been looking at slash walls. And there's a couple of other, um, a couple of other different ways that you can utilize this. So, you know, planting in a bunch of rubus or raspberries seems to be really effective. That's not great for us, but, <laughs> you know, there's a reason that, that deer don't want to go in there. And it's the same reason we don't want to go in there. So planting in rubus, planting with slash walls, uh, on May 20th at noon, um, the Cornell, uh, was it Forest Connect webinar? So look up Forest Connect webinar and a couple of folks are doing a talk on those slash walls and how they can be used to repel deer. So that might be of interest. Um, but yeah, the, it's definitely expensive, but it is the easiest way to keep deer out is, is a fence or a cage. That's my go-to um, in, in any situation that I can. Um, all right, let's see. Do we have another question? What about using brewer's mash that contains hops? Oh, hey, Doug. Um, yeah, brewer's mash containing hops. I don't know. I've, I've never seen that mentioned, but worth a shot. You should try it, Doug. Uh, let us know how it goes. Um, and then, oh, so uh, for you guys as a follow-up to, to the question about the Erie National Wildlife Refuge, um, Jules put a link to that in the chat box if you want to check out that video. Um, of planting trees. So a little bit more background on that planting. So that's the Erie National Wildlife Refuge, which is up in northwestern Pennsylvania. The idea was to plant blight susceptible American chestnuts um, as early successional habitat. So they would be planted in, a, in an open field, uh, be allowed to grow up with other materials, uh, produce nuts, which they can. So even if a tree has no resistance to the blight whatsoever, they can produce nuts and, and produce food for wildlife. Then I think the plan will be, we're, we'll investigate this as time goes on, but the plan will be to just reset that site um, every 10 or 15 years when you get an epidemic of blight to come in, you just reset it, let the uh, sprouts re-sprout and have them go through that early succession again. Uh, so we'll see how well that works as sort of a wildlife food plot, if you will. Um, and uh, so it's only been planted in the ground for about a year or two. There is an article in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey chapter newsletter, uh, if you want to check out from Melissa Althouse, I believe is her name. And so you can check out that for a little bit more information on that planting. Uh, well, I think that does it for um, all of the questions. I don't see any more in Q&A. I don't see any more in the chat box. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us for uh, episode two of Chestnut Chat. And uh, we'll be doing it again next week. Lisa, you want to talk a little bit more about what, we're, what we have on tap? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, just to back up a little bit, last week's Chestnut Chat is recorded in case you missed, um, missed that one. Uh, it's really worth just the, even listening in the, in, in the beginning to hear Sarah and Jared's stories and um, share my feelings about the, the wonderful organization that we're all a part of. So I think Jules is going to get that um, posted somewhere. Jules Smith is our wonderful communications manager. She keeps us all organized and communicating. Um, but uh, we hope to have these every Friday. They're obviously very informal. Um, it's just a way for us to connect when we're all, most of us are homebound. Um, we are doing really well as an organization, um, especially compared to a lot of nonprofits our size. Uh, so just keep those good thoughts um, to keep us strong, TACF strong. Uh, we're going to make it through this. 
Um, so hopefully next week, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna um, be sharing this um, Zoom format with our colleagues at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Of course, that's Dr. Bill Powell and um, his work out of um, that lab and, and share some information about the transgenic tree and that process. Uh, last week's Chestnut Chat created a lot of um, questions and buzz about what the status of the tree is and where it is in the regulatory process. I won't go into that now so we can end on time, but um, it is coming up. Uh, they've sent in a petition for the deregulation of the Darling 58 tree, and um, we are expecting it to open up into a public comment period any day now. It'll be, um, the petition will be put on the federal register, so we are really working hard organizing um, uh, stakeholders and folks that can send in positive comments about this wonderful tool for conservation. Um, so that's happening. So anyway, we will want to share that um, team members, those team members with you. Andy Newhouse is his lead graduate student. He just um, finished his PhD work and his exams. Um, so he'll probably be on it. And just so you can get some faces to the names of the folks that are working up in SUNY and our, our lead um, academic partners there. So uh, we hope that will happen next week. We haven't got conference confirmation yet, but it will be happening. We also want to do some virtual tours. Uh, I know all of us would rather be outside right now than indoors and starting to do our field work and our growing season work. Um, so we're going to do some virtual tours, hopefully at Meadowview Farm, our, our main research farm in Meadowview, Virginia, and perhaps um, at Penn State, uh, maybe even up in Syracuse. So uh, stay tuned for that. That'll take a little more coordination and maybe a Go, GoPro or a video on somebody's um, smartphone. So we're, we're doing our best to reach out to all of you um, to stay connected because it's really important that we get through this um, still as a community and, and keeping it together. So really appreciate everyone. Um, just feel free to in, email me, uh, lisa at tacf.org or sarah, S-A-R-A -A, at tacf.org if you have any follow-up questions or ideas for future ones. Um, we appreciate all of you who came today. Uh, thank you so much for your interest and We'll see you next week.